Um, Stephanie, how do you want to be introduced? Oh, just Stephanie and Farrow. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I have to share my screen now and I can't, no promises. Um, okay, someone walk me through a press share screen. Yes. Okay. Can you guys see that? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So um, me and Sandy today are going to talk a little bit about the home front during World War One. I. I specifically focused on the American home front. I don't know, Sandy, did you? Um, Pretty much American home front. That's what I'm familiar with. Okay. Yeah. I, I like did a couple slides on um, Germany, but other than that, it's mostly the American viewpoint. Um, Okay, so um, the food problems that they faced in World War I are just as relevant today as they were back then. Um, the average American wastes uh, $1,800 in food a year, which seems like a lot because I know we're really careful about that. Um, but it's especially import important today when um, you know we've got this pandemic thing going on. So um, my goal for my presentation is that you'll just check out a couple of the resources that I have um, on my slides. There's um, a couple of like PDF books um, and a few videos. So if you guys could just check those out, that would be great. Um, so are we ready to get started? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Start with the video. <laughs> I tried to make it taste slightly less like mud. Not easy, I'm afraid, Captain. Why is this? What's it, you love? <laughs> we ran out of coffee 13 months ago. So every time I've drunk your coffee since, I haven't had Okay, everyone know what that that's from? Black <laughs> Adam. Okay, next slide. <laughs> Encore. What we're seeing here, they're talking about shortages. Um, there were shortages in World War I, but it wasn't nearly this bad. Um, most countries did everything they can that they could to um, make sure that, sorry, my screen's being weird, make sure that the soldiers at the front got all of the food and everyone else um, would be taken care of later. So, um, next slide. This is a picture of Allied soldiers um, eating in France. Um, the soldiers ate a lot. <laughs> so if you guys can see on the screen, that's their ration in 1914. Um, it didn't vary a lot, but it's a lot of food. You see how much meat's there? It's like a pound. Um, so they were eating a lot of meat. It just burned a lot of food. It just wasn't what they wanted to be eating. It was very bland and um, unchanging. So they were eating it the same thing over and over again. Um, in comparison, this is the German ration in 1914. Um, they were very potato heavy and not so much meat. Um, and it was about a thousand calories less, less than what the Americans and the, well, than what the British were eating at this time. So that's just because I know someone's going to ask me about what the rations were, but that's not the focus of this presentation. So during uh, 1915, uh, things were okay, but then um, countries ran into a lot of problems. Um, in 1916, there were European crop failures. Many uh, battlefields destroyed farms and farming equipment. Um, the G German U-boat campaign destroyed uh, merchant ships and supply ships. And um, also, a lot of soldiers were farmers before the war. So they left, and um, there really wasn't, you know, people taking their place places. Um, 
Okay, so I'm not going to read this, but you can read it while I'm talking. Um, this is just a quote from a German soldier by, um, I believe this is 1916 at this point. So by 1916, um, the Germans were faring a lot worse. Um, they were even raiding enemy trenches just for food, um, especially like bully beef, which the, the British soldiers hated, but it was good to them. They really didn't have a lot of meat. Um, and the winter um, from 1916 and 1917 in Germany is known as the turnip winter because, because of that um, bad crop season and the British blockade being very effective and losing that manpower like we just like I just said, um, they lost their main source of calories which was potatoes. Um, so they changed over to turnips um, which were traditionally used in Germany as animal feed so it wasn't something that people really ate. Um, throughout the war, food shortages um, contributed to 750,000 deaths there, so um, it was bad for them. Okay, so up until this point, um, 1917, the U.S. had been neutral, but they joined the war, and they had to address the food problem. And the food problem was feeding Allied troops, feeding the Americans, and then feeding war-torn Europe. Um, they're feeding a lot more people than they had to feed. And this was a huge logistical feat, but they did it, right? Um, we all know that. Um, so between 1918 and 1919, consumption in America was cut back by 15%, um, and the amount of food shipped to Europe doubled. So how did they do it? Um, in 1917, Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson established the US Food Administration. Um, at this point, everyone was pretty, pretty much short of everything. Um, so the point of the US Food Administration um, was pretty much to stop speculating, um, to make sure transport was working, um, and to make sure people weren't charging way too much for food. Um, so who would lead the, the Food Administration? Do you guys know who this is here? Yeah. <laughs> Hoover. Okay, well, this is uh, Mina Van Winkle. Mina Van Winkle. She was a suffragist and police lieutenant after the war. So she's a, a super badass woman who is not in charge. Um, but she was appointed to, to um, organize the Food Administration Speakers Bureau. Um, so I believe Sandy's going to touch on her a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But he appoints this guy, um, who is six feet tall, independently wealthy, a Stanford graduate, and philanthropist who spent his early years of the war feeding Belgian citizens. Right, ladies? No, um, it's Herbert Hoover. Um, I choose, I never like to put old pictures of, um, you know, famous people. I always pick their young ones because they always show like George Washington when he's older. Um, but I don't think it's doing him justice, right? This guy, Herbert Hoover. Oh, let me go back. Okay. So um, he did have a lot of experience. Um, his, uh, he worked like 14 hour days and his organization, the Commission Relief in Belgium. Um, sourced and delivered 2 million tons of food to 9 million civilians. Um, he also established a committee in 1914 that distributed relief to 40,000 Americans. So it wasn't like he was underqualified. <laughs> um, so that, this is the act, you don't really need to know this act, but this is the thing that created the, the Food Administration. Oh, it also um, banned alcohol production. Um, any alcohol that's uh, made with produce, that would be food, you know, you don't want to condense it in this, this time. Okay, so their main, for, their main focus was um, to not have to ration um, the way that rationing happened in World War II. Um, they didn't want anything official, and there was very little rationing in World War I. And I say very little because I think towards the end of the war there was like one or two months where sugar was rationed a little bit, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, so they focused on a robust propaganda campaign, and this, this is mostly going to talk about the signs. Um, I'm just so fascinated um, with the propaganda that came out of World War I. Um, but this was before um, radio and TV, um, so they focused on posters, billboards, classes, um, church services would talk about, um, you know, being a good potato patriot. Um, newspapers, books, and magazines. Most of the um, 
most of the focus, it was like peer pressure. It was pressure. Um, they appealed to patriotism. And uh, this is like a pledge that's on the screen. Um, this one's for little kids who wouldn't understand why conservation was important. They just needed the kids to agree with it, not waste their food when they, you know, took lunches to school and things. Um, and 12 million families signed pledges like this um, that they wouldn't waste food. Okay, so in 1917, Hoover called for one meatless meal and one wheatless meal each week, um, but that quickly morphed into this food schedule that you see on the screen here that's pretty goofy. Um, it almost looks like you can't have anything. Um, this is what it comes down to. Their focus, um, the focus of this propaganda was pretty much, you know, buy food with thought, cook it with care, use less wheat and meat, buy local foods, serve just enough, and use what is left. So um, in the next few slides, I'm going to go over just some of the techniques that they were using. So um, for wheat and bread, they encouraged wheatless Mondays and Wednesdays and an overall reduction in wheat consumption, um, especially white wheat. So white wheat was seen as, um, it was seen as like a morale booster. So um, brown bread is what they were encouraging people to eat. Um, they had something, I'll go. Sorry, getting ahead of myself. Okay, um, so this quote here, you guys can read it. Like I said, I'm not gonna read it. Um, but this was a soldier from Honey Grove, Texas, um, who talked about his bread being white and nice as can be. They were sending the really good wheat to the front so the soldiers um, wouldn't get demoralized by having to eat what they thought was like lesser, um, lesser bread, which is what you know German soldiers were eating. So um, this is New York, and um, I love this, the war bread wagon. <laughs> um, so this was like a demo that showed different kinds of um, bread mixtures you could make that um, would help cut the, the nice wheat out. Um, these are some wheat substitutions that they were um, promoting. So cornmeal, rye, oatmeal, barley. Um, whole wheat, which uses more of the grain, so you get more bread out, you know, more bread out of what you have. Um, and also potatoes. So many of these slides are just pictures that I thought um, were interesting. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so fats and sugars. Um, this is butterine, um, which we would call like a margarine today. Um, this is when margarine really, really hit it big um, as a fat substitute, a butter substitution. Um, but just keep in mind during this time period, butter, well, margarine was still pink. Um, there were laws that you couldn't make yellow margarine at this time um, because people would confuse it with butter. Um, the Knox gelatin extender, I have a recipe for that um, on this, on the slideshow. And that was a pretty famous one that also, um, saw use in World War II, so that one's useful. Um, and sugar substitutions, um, they were using maple syrup, molasses, honey, um, and corn syrup. And this is where corn syrup really got big in the American diet. And this is that, um, that recipe I was just talking about. So fruits and vegetables um, were a big deal. Um, they encouraged people to grow their own gardens and to keep that food for themselves. So they're sending the shelf stable stuff to the front. So the soldiers weren't receiving that many um, fresh fruits and vegetables, um, but they're eliminating the transport problem of getting those things to them. So they encouraged people um, to grow war gardens and these were rebranded as victory gardens after the war, um, but during the war they were called war gardens. Um, people were really encouraged to eat local um, this was right after the United States started mega farming. So there were huge farms and a lot of the produce was coming from these huge farms, but then they were limited by transporting it, um, having to get it everywhere. So it really benefited them to have, uh, to decentralize the food at this point. Um, so once the returning soldiers came back, um, they were so into fruit that people were like throwing it at them. Um, and that's, um, they were like really into it. There was one um, reference of a soldier eating them off the ground and the woman who threw it was like, I don't know, but um, it's still a treat for them. 
So um, over here, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse. I don't know. Can you guys see it? Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's a PDF here of um, the War Garden Guide, um, which uh, talks about how to grow your own War Garden. These are War Gardeners near DC. I think they're super cute. Um, and they're wearing pants, which is a big deal. <laughs> um, the Farmerettes um, and the Women Women's Land Army. Um, so I love this picture because this is my hometown of Newtown Square, Pennsylvania. Um, so I, I know where that is. Um, and farmerettes uh, were women who sought to replace the openings left by young farmers who went to war. Um, I don't have an American statistic, um, but Britain sent 170,000 farmers to war. Um, so it was enough that US farmers, um, you know, they needed farmerettes to take over. Um, so around 20,000 women took part in this um, between 1917 and 1918. And a lot of the farmerettes um, were suffragists who were taking the opportunity um, to further the women's rights movement by doing a traditionally male job and wearing pants. And they had some um, pretty cool signs. This one's from Philadelphia. This one's from New Jersey. <laughs> and um, these ones are, are from uh, New York. This was a parade in Philadelphia. And then after the war, there was actually like a worry that the farmers weren't going to come back. Um, so this is a, a famous song called How Are You Going to Keep Them Back, um, keep, them, keep Them Down on the Farm After They've seen Paris, they thought now that they've all been to Europe, they're definitely not going to come back to the farms. They're going to stay in the cities. Um, and there is a, a link down there if you want to hear that song. So um, after you grew everything, preservation um, was really important. And this is probably the easiest thing that you can do today to save food, um, is learn how to uh, process your food when you're done. So we have the benefit of having freezers, which is like the easiest way. You just throw everything in the freezer and it's there. Um, but they had to rely a lot on drying and canning. Um, I do believe there's a, a book down at the bottom there, The Victory Garden 1919, um, which talks about canning. Do, do all of you know what canning is? <laughs> yes, no, okay. So yeah. this confuses a lot of people who have never done it, but like you can see um, on the picture on the right, there's a jar. Um, you do it in jars, but it's called canning. Um, but it's the same thing that, you know, the companies like Campbell's do, put things in the jar um, and seal it up. Okay. Um, so soldiers were, were receiving a lot of these like jellies and jams that were homemade. Um, but just keep in mind for them that the fruit, the, the fresh fruit was a luxury. Oops. Okay. Okay. So um, this is not um, exactly related to food, but um, I mean, it comes from food. So there was a push for everyone to do their bit and save a pit. Um, and a pit meant peach pits, olive pits, apricot pits, and hickory nut shells, um, among other things, um, for gas masks. So gas masks were new to the army um, at this time. And they were using these, um, these pits for filters. Um, so they would char them and um, it would help with any kind of gas um, that they encountered. Now in the corner there, there is um, a video on how the gas masks were made, so you can see them charring up the pits and stuff, and it's pretty cool. Um, they originally tried to use coconut shells, but they had sourcing issues. So, no. Sorry. So these are just some of the um, promotional materials this is um, in Boston as an officer standing on his pile of peach pits. This is Chicago, the Red Cross nurses with theirs. Girl Scouts. <laughs> Rachel didn't come to this. You guys all know Rachel McCullough. Um, she does a, a traveling Girl Scout um, Women's History Museum. Um, so I put this one on for her. Um, so this was just really cool. This is something I hadn't heard of. Um, and I thought it was neat how um, they were doing that. So um, this is a side note, Germany was doing drives like this too, but in true German fashion, they were collecting hog and cow intestines for Zeppelins. So um, they needed 250,000 cows or the equivalent of 33 million sausages um, to make one Zeppelin. So that's just something you know now. <laughs> <laughs> Fun fact. 
Um, so meat and protein. So um, they really were pushing meat, meatless and porkless days, especially Tuesdays and Saturdays. Um, but pamphlets at the time were very careful to advise that um, meat wasn't removed from the diet without um, finding a protein substitution. And these are some of the substitutions, cottage cheese, fish, because you can't ship them, um, beans, peas, and lentils, nuts, peanut butter, and potatoes. So this is just... Um, so cities during this time raised their bans on raising pigs in the city and people joined pig clubs and they were raising meat to send to the front. Um, so back here, there's just cottage cheese was very important. There's a link to a book on cottage cheese dishes and some fun recipes in there like cottage cheese and peanut butter soup, um, cottage cheese sausage, and, um, you know, pie crust. Um, and here's a tutorial for how to do it if you want to do it yourself. Um, this book was used as a textbook, um, teaching people, um, especially young kids, how to save. And then this last one is just what you can do if you want to um, conserve in modern times, but I'm not going to read it. You guys can read it later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any questions? This is great. Thank you, Stephanie. Do you guys want to watch the video or no? Uh, sh you guys can watch it later. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll, I'll post it on the site. Okay, sounds good. How do I stop sharing? <laughs> Um, on the top. Okay, great. Okay. Sorry, that was so long. That was great. That was really good. Any questions for Stephanie? All right, let me. Sandy, we we welcome you now. Sandy is a Navy veteran. Yep. And what are you going to share with us today? Well, I'm going to talk specifically about the U.S. Food Administration um, and uh, Herbert Hoover and Mina Van Winkle and some of the ways that uh, the public was educated, some of the uh, methods that they used. Um, Stephanie touched a little bit on um, Herbert Hoover. And in 1914, Hoover initially was raising funds um, to help for passage of Americans that were stranded in Europe during the war. Um, and a little side note on that, during this fundraising portion, getting this money to, the, um, to Great Britain to help Americans get back, the USS Tennessee, which was an armored cruiser, um, happened to be my grandfather's ship, and he was on it at the time. They took $6 million in gold bullion to London. Um, and then they evacuated Americans out of Le Havre and Rotterdam um, after dropping off the gold bullion. Um, the U.S. ambassador to Great Britain, William Page, thought that Hoover did such a great job with getting Americans out of Europe and getting funds raised to get Americans back home to the States that he asked him to form the Commission for Relief of Belgium. Um, Hoover actually was able to negotiate with the Germans to allow safe passage of food to Bel the Belgian civilian population and to prevent the German army from confiscating um, those foodstuffs. Um, once America enters the war, um, the administration of the Commission for Belgium Relief is now transferred to the Spanish ambassador. Hoover comes back to the United States and Woodrow Wilson puts him in charge of the U.S. Food Administration. Um, he is encouraging voluntary rationing on the part of individuals and the term Hooverize came into popularity. When you started adjusting your menus to meet Hoover's guidelines, you were Hooverizing your food. Um, he tapped Mina Van Winkle. Um, as Stephanie said, she was a suffragist. She was the first female police lieutenant in uh, Washington, D.C. She was a social worker and she was no stranger to social activism or getting out in front of people and lecturing and giving classes. Um, the restrictions applied not only to um, commercial establishments, but it actually reached back into the agricultural community. And um, this is a sample of two receipts that I happen to have in my personal collection. Um, the one is for scratch feed. Um, 
poultry farmers were limited to how much scratch feed that they could use for chickens. They were actually encouraged to have their chickens free range. The second is a receipt for mill feed, wheat-based mill feed uh, for cattle and uh, calves, pigs, and that you could um, only have six days supply on hand. You could not hoard it and it had to be used strictly for livestock feed. You couldn't buy it and then try and pawn it off um, to individuals to use for human consumption. This is something that um, John got for me. He found it at a flea market. Um, it's kind of ancillary to the Food Administration. This is from the Connecticut State Council on Defense and it's, pr it's protecting the agricultural supply. Um, if you are caught trespassing in planted fields uh, during the war, you could be subject to a $100 fine or six months in prison. Um, for destroying property, for stealing food. Um, so they were, Connecticut was pretty serious about, you're not gonna tamper with the food supply. Um, on commercial establishments, wheat and flour were restricted. This is a sample of, this is an actual sugar distribution certificate that a commercial establishment would use. Um, it was for a thousand pounds. It would go to something like a commercial bakery. Um, it was dated until October 15th, 1918, but you'll see that it was, it was extended to January 15th, 1919, because when the war ended in November of eight, 1918, the famine and food shortages didn't end either. So you, you, they extended the rationing out um, into 1919. Um, if you fail to comply, this is a bakery in Washington, D.C. And uh, he was closed for failing to abide by the wheat substitution rules. Um, he was closed, I think, for three days. Um, if you fail to adhere to substitution guidelines, pricing guidelines, if you were caught price gouging, um, if you refuse to sell at what the government mandated you should sell your goods at, um, et cetera, or if you were hoarding, you were subject to fines. You were subject to temporary closures as this baker was subject to. Um, and if it was severe enough, you could actually even lose your business license. They'd, they'd put you out of business. Um, the fines that were collected did not go to the government. They were sort of a forced donation to the American Red Cross. Um, so when you were fined, your money didn't go to Uncle Sam, it went to the Red Cross. On the um, public side, um, educating the public, they used, tra trains were the big method of getting the word out. They would set up classrooms in the Food Administration in conjunction with the railroads, would set up classrooms in um, train cars. Um, the Illinois Central actually had an entire kitchen with stoves and ovens set up in um, a train car. Um, this is the Pen Pennsylvania Railroad. Um, this is mostly demonstration um, and displays. It was the food train. Um, that was the Pennsylvania Railroad. The Erie Railroad had one. The Long Island Railroad had a food train. Um, and as I said, the Illinois Central. This is Long Island Railroad. Um, the Long Island Food Reserve Battalion. Uh, ran demonstrations, and that was headed up by Mrs. William K. Vanderbilt. Um, and she also donated tractors to the State University at Farmingdale for their agricultural program. Um, so she was very into um, the food conservation mode. Um, these cars were set up to instruct women um, on how to can, how to dry foods, how to preserve foods, how to make the appropriate substitutions of wheat flour, uh, with barley or oats or rice flour. And then we have the community kitchen. This is Mrs. Van Winkle um, in a community kitchen. And these would be set up in various towns. I know in Chester, where I live, just down the road from where I live, um, they had the Orange County Food Battalion community kitchen. And you would have classes at the community kitchen. And again, teaching women how to can food, how to process food, how to make the appropriate substitutions. 
They would also, the food service volunteers would also go to public parks. These are food service volunteers in a minority community um, instructing uh, women on how to um, stretch their food budgets, how to make the substitutions, how to um, eat less meat, eat more grains, eat um, more vegetables, and uh, conserve those foods. The other thing that the Food Administration does did was they would give out recipe cards um, free. This is a uh, rice flour sponge cake, and any of you who went to the um, flea market at uh, in in the Bronx, that was the cake that we made uh, that we brought with us. Um, it's a rice flour cake. Um, it's a sponge cake. Yes, it does use a lot of sugar, but it's not using any wheat flour. So you kind of trade off things in some of the meals. If you're using sugar, then you're not going to be using wheat. Or if you're using um, if you're using wheat, you're not going to be using meat or something like that. But you're not going totally eliminating everything from every meal. Um, women's magazines, the illustration on the right is from the March 18th Ladies Home Journal. Um, it's an advertisement for oats and there are recipes for how to uh, stretch your meat, um, make meatloaf by adding um, oats to as a binder and to stretch it. Um, the cookbook is 44 ways to win the war from the Marshall Field Company. That's a big department store in Chicago. And they produced this cookbook um, with recipes that would help stretch the meat, provide substitutions, and of course, advertise all of their home appliances that you would use in the kitchen. Um, that would be your publicity cookbook. This one um, I actually have in my collection, um, the original. This is uh, by the Royal Baking Powder Company. And again, they'd have these little pamphlets that they would sent, sell for like a nickel, 10 cents a piece, and promoting food conservation, food substitutions. This is one of the, another war bread demonstration. Um, this is in St. Louis. Um, and the Food Administration would have parades and rallies and demonstrations out in public. Um, they'd have a flatbed truck and they'd have a group of the food service volunteer ladies. Um, showing how to make the bread, how to do the substitutions. Um, conserving the commodities, peer pressure, education, and local restrictions. Um, you signed an you if you were going to participate, you signed an oath, and you were given this nifty little window placard to put in the front window of your home. Now, of course, peer pressure means that nobody in the neighborhood wants to be the only one that doesn't have one of these nifty little cards in the window, so, kind of get pressured by the everybody else having them to to uh, get your card and have it in your window. This one is interesting. This is a reporting card. And if you notice up on the top, it says church and city. This is something that you would get at church. You would fill it out. How many wheatless meals you had, how many meatless meals you had, how many meals you used you made using leftovers so that you can serve, you weren't throwing things out. And then you mailed it back to your church food conservation committee. So the person in, in uh, the person in charge of the committee, the food conservation committee knew who in church was uh, playing by the rules. Um, so again, more peer pressure. And this is the book um, Stephanie talked about, uh, Food Sha Saving and Sharing. It was a textbook handed out to teachers that they were used to, that was used to instruct older students, say middle school or so, um, on the need to conserve food. And this was the card that you got, uh, that you signed and sent back saying that you did receive this. Um, this is the inside front cover. Um, and it talks about uh, to the boys and girls of America, you can help others, you can help too in getting others to do the same. You can help um, three times a day by wisely choosing what your food. You can help save from famine untold numbers of your friends across the sea. Kind of the, uh, um, as my grandmother used to say, there's kids starving in India type thing. Well, this was sort of the whole thing. Um, this is the inside front cover. It had a map of the areas that were suffering from the greatest um, uh, shortages of food. 
um, and then the title page um, telling telling how older children of America may help may help save from famine their comrades in allied lands across the sea. Um, this is one of the local restrictions. Um, not every not every area had this. This was 1918. This was August 1918. As Stephanie said, towards the end of the war, they started getting more restrictive. And this is actually a sugar ration car, card. Um, you were allowed two pounds of sugar per month per person, which to me seems like an awful lot because two pounds of sugar in my house lasts about six months. Um, but this is a sugar ration card. Um, this is this is the first time I saw one of these. I was looking around the other day and I, I came across this. Um, this was toward, as Stephanie said, this was towards the end of the war. This is August um, 1918 that this came out and the war was over, ended essentially November 1918. And then after the end of the war, you got the great big thank you certificate signed by President Hoover and your state uh, food board administra food administration um, administrator. A um, couple of recipes. Um, these are things that uh, my grandmother, the World War I wife and mother, would send feed us as candy. Um, stuffed dates, taking a day, very easy to make. You just take the pits out, replace the pit with a walnut or a pecan, roll it in coconut, and you're good to go. And then fruit and nut bars. Um, mine's still chilling in the refrigerator. It still hasn't quite set up yet, but it's equal parts of um, dates or raisins, and then equal parts of nuts and enough molasses to hold the whole thing together. You kind of squish it into a bar, wrap it up in wax paper, or stick it in the refrigerator till it solidifies. Um, and that's about it. So if anybody has any questions, Cool, that was great, Sandy. Thank you. And all of those, um, all the paper documents, except for the uh, 44 ways to win the war and the sugar ration card are actually my personal collection. Um, so I've been, that's my daughter's birthday and Mother's Day present. She buys me more paper stuff. Great. Okay, there's one other thing. Oh, I, I want to show um, this lady. I don't know if you can see her. Um, you might recognize her if you've ever watched The Wizard of Oz. Is that Billy this Burke? Is Linda, the Good Witch of the North, Billy Burke, as a food service worker during World War I. Wow, that's so cool. Thank you, Sandy. Anybody have any questions? I see we're uh, joined by a uh, baby tank driver here. <laughs> Hi, Clara. Yes, I Hi, Clara. Hi, Clara. <laughs> oh, and there is a recipe sheet in the PDF files um, on East Coast Doughboys uh, for uh, several recipes, desserts, um, salmon loaf, um, all the wonderful things my grandmother used to feed me when I was growing up. Yeah, the recipes would be good to see. Was the Wilson era um, food administration, was that the descendant of the current Food and Drug Administration? Or was it? No, the, the Food Administration, um, the Food, food Administration, um, about 1919 disbanded. Once, once the supply chain got back up and running and the crisis was over, the Food Administration disbanded. Um, the Food and Drug Administration actually goes back more towards um, Theodore Roosevelt and uh, the meat inspections and you know the era of Upton Sinclair and the jungle and... Interesting, thank you. Yep. That was really good, um, both you guys. Thank you so much. Um, really knocked it out of the park there. And I didn't know a lot of that stuff. It was really amazing to read. I knew about the, the railroads in uh, Long Island, but I know it was all over the country too. It, it was pretty much, you know, I, I've, I've definitely found for the Erie, the Pennsylvania, um, and the Illinois Central. And with that widespread, I would assume other places also were doing it because rail was the primary method of transportation. Mm -hmm. And it was easier to get people to come to the train station than to get them to go, people all go into a city. You could just take the train through every little whistle stop along the way. Yeah. 
that was really good. Now I, I'm e eager to look at the video that uh, Stephanie and Paul made too. I wanna check that out. Um, we'll post it on the site. You just want to see more Black Adder. <laughs> 